So our next speaker um, is Simon Singh. Um, now his books don't really follow a pattern, um, but he is a broadcaster. Um, so film was last year, that's 97. Code book is 99. Big Bang is 2004. So if you want everything, then that's the beginning of it. Uh, Trick or Treatment, 2008, and then The Simpsons and Their Mathematical Secrets, 2013. As you can see, you, you, are, you are invited to come up with a proof for what the next book will be and what year it will be published. Um, so there are a number of things in here, but really for me it was, um, it was the Horizon program um, that ultimately led to the book on Fermat's Last Theorem that uh, uh, Simon directed. Um, it is a wonderfully human tale. Um, yes, it's, yes, it's, it's, yes, it's about maths, but actually you get a real sense of the humanity and the, the stories, and it is deeply human at that level, whilst also touching upon some fascinating aspects of maths that I think although we think, yeah, Fermat has been done, but actually the journey there un uncovered so many possibilities that mathemat uh, mathematicians will be kind of raking over the possibilities for uh, decades, if not centuries to come. So, a uh, big hand for Simon. Simon says, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Kevin, and, th and thank you for reminding me about the documentary. I'm going to talk about the book today, but if people have seen the documentary, or if you haven't seen it, it's still on the iPlayer, you can still watch it, but um, it opens with a, I think it's still very proud of that opening sequence where Andrew Wiles is talking about his proof of Fermat's last theorem, and just the memory of that proof brings him to tears, makes him cry, and... and um, you may have had that experience where doing maths has made you want to cry. Um, <laughs> this is slightly, slightly different. So, um, so yeah, so I've written a few books over the years, um, and um, they all tend to be quite historical. They all tend to have quite human stories as well. So with Big Bang, kind of history of cosmology, um, I talk about the cosmology, but I also talk about the cosmologists and their stories and their quirks and so on. So, for example, there's a guy called Fritz Vicky. Can I just say how weird it is giving a talk? I haven't given a talk for two years. It's, uh, <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen from here. But um, uh, yeah, no, I can still remember his name. There's a guy called Fritz Vicky, who's the guy who came up with the concept of dark matter. So I explain how we came up with the concept of dark matter and how we know that idea is a good idea today. Uh, but I also explain that he was very grumpy, uh, quite, quite a, a, a grumpy chap to hang around with. And... Um, if, he, if, if Fritz Vicky didn't like you, he would invent an insult specially for you. Uh, my favorite insult was when he once called somebody a spherical bastard, spherical bastard. And by that he meant a sphere is, the object, is an object which looks the same whichever way you look at it. And a spherical bastard is someone who's a bastard whichever way you look at them. So, um, um, so um, but yeah, the book I'm gonna talk about this evening is Fermat's Last Theorem. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the history and the backstory to it and then later on we're gonna have a chat and we'll talk about some other aspects perhaps and there'll be Q&A. So whatever I don't cover, uh, we can maybe get to later. But um, th this is the guy that caused all the fuss. This is Pierre de Fermat, French mathematician, lived some 350 years ago. Um, and he, he was not a professional mathematician. It's a different time. There weren't really professional mathematicians in the way we know them today. Uh, his job was a judge near Toulouse. And every evening, he would go home uh, to his farmhouse. He also had a farm. And, and maths was just his hobby. And because he was in Toulouse, he was a long way from the salons in Paris. And he didn't really have the opportunity to discuss his ideas in the way that maybe other mathematicians of the time could. Um, and, and the way he did his maths was each evening, um, Typically, this was his favorite book, The Arithmetica by Diophantus of Alexandria. And every evening he would um, just look at this book, which was full of puzzles and problems. And you can see, I think it's the Greek is on the right and the Latin is on the left. He got question eight and question nine. And he would just look at these problems and try and think about them and try and solve them. Now, question eight is, an, is, is the one that's relevant to what I'm talking about this evening. And question eight was actually quite a straightforward problem. Um, it just said, can you find whole number solutions to Pythagoras' equation? Or, or just, just you know, an integer squared plus an integer squared equals an integer squared. Can you find, can you find those numbers? Can you numerate them and so on? And, and Fermat knew this back to front. He knew how to do this. Uh, it might have been a tricky problem in Diophantus' time, but it wasn't a problem for Fermat. So he decided to um, up the ante and make the problem a bit more difficult. So he invented a slightly different version. So you know, he knew that three squared plus four squared is five squared, 12 squared plus five squared is 13 squared. 
but he changed the question. So instead of x squared plus y squared is z squared, he looked at x to the n plus y to the n is z to the n, where n is any number bigger than 2. Okay? And he said, I wonder how many solutions I'll find here. And you know, the, one equation at the top has got an infinite number of solutions. And here I've got an infinite number of equations. So surely there'll be an infinity of infinite solutions. But the more that Fermat looked, the more he couldn't find any whole number solutions, any whole number non-trivial solutions. Um, he found a few things like um, 6 cubed plus 8 cubed equals 9 cubed minus 1. Some near misses. But nothing that quite fitted the bill, nothing that really was an exact solution. And um, at some point, he didn't just say, look, I can't find any solutions. At some point, he convinced himself he had a proof. He convinced himself that he could prove that with an infinite number of equations and an infinite number of numbers, there were no whole number solutions. And he wrote in the margin of his book, in the Arithmetica, he wrote in the margin of this book, he wrote, I have a truly marvelous proof uh, of this proposition. I have a demonstration memorablum. Hank marginis exiguatis non caparate. I have a truly marvelous proof which this margin is too narrow to contain. And then he dropped dead. Um, <laughs> or at some point, a few years later, he died. And his son was going through his, his father's uh, collection of books, and he, he was going through this book. And um, the book was full of these little notes. The book was, actually, the Fermat did this a lot. I can prove this, but I've got to go and feed the cat. I can prove this, <laughs> I've got to go wash my hair or something. But, uh, and so his son, Samuel, published a new edition of the book. And in the new edition of the book, there were all these observations of Father Pierre de Fermat. Okay, this is the famous one. But there were lots of these notes. And, and the new edition of the Arithmetica was published. And it had these little notes from Fermat. And the question was, Fermat said he could prove these things. Can we go away and find those proofs? Um, and and over, the, over, over the years, mathematicians went away and tried to find the proofs. And in every single situation, whenever Fermat said, this is true, I can prove it, in every single situation, people went away, they found the truth, they found the proof, and it was indeed true. Fermat was right, except for this one. That's why it's known as Fermat's last theorem, because it was the last one anybody could actually go away and prove. And because it was the last one, it was the most glorious one, the most um, sought after one. And... Um, and that's it. That's Fermat's last theorem. That's how it all came to be. Um, centuries passed. People look for proofs. Um, now, you might think, well, look, you know, if, if nobody can find any numbers, if, if you know, decades and decades pass, why don't we just assume that it must be true? If we can't find the numbers, um, why don't we just assume it's true? Um, well, here, here's something called Euler's conjecture, which is about a century after Fermat, where Euler, Leonard Euler, the great mathematician, proposed, conjectured, that you'll never find three-fourths powers that add up to a fourth power. It's slightly different to Fermat's last theorem, okay, where n's bigger than three. Here we're only looking at n is four, and we're looking at three-fourth powers equaling a fourth power. So this must be from the, 1800, uh, from the 1700s, I think. Two centuries pass, nobody can find whole number solutions. People are becoming increasingly convinced that this must be true, the conjecture must be correct, can't prove it, but we can't find any whole number solutions. And then in the 1980s, this pops up, OK? So you know, in maths, infinity is a very big space. And if you, um, you, know, if you, if you haven't checked infinity, if you've only checked up to a million, there's still infinitely many numbers left. So you, you, have to, you either have a proof or you don't have anything. Um, I'm going to skip. This is one of Lord. Oh, just, just going to talk about one kind of proof, just to give you an idea. Um, if you, if you haven't really explored this idea of a proof in, in any detail, this is a nice example to talk about in terms of what a proof is and, and why it's different from just amassing evidence. You know, in science, we amass a lot of evidence and observations and experiments. And, and if all the data points in one direction, we say, oh, we've proved this, this scientific idea. But we haven't really proved it. We've just got a lot of evidence to suggest that it's, it's probably true. You know, when you convict somebody of a crime, you have... Uh, you know, you have enough evidence to prove they're guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. 
but you haven't proved it 100%. But in maths, you do prove things 100%. You have absolute, perfect, beautiful proofs. And so here's an example of that. Um, so this is a problem. I think it goes back to Martin Gardner. Uh, well, you have a chessboard. It's slightly hard to see the blacks and the white squares, but hopefully you can just make them out. And, and you remove two, two corners. Okay, so I've removed the two opposite corners of the chessboard. So instead of having 64 squares, I've only got 62. And um, I give you some 32, no, 31 dominoes. Each domino covers two squares. And the question is, can you cover the 62 squares with the 31 dominoes? Okay, well, pro probably you can. And you, you might try a few different arrangements, pop a few more down. Yeah, it's looking good, we're getting there. Oh, right, I'm down to my last four, down here, and I've got two dominoes left. If I put a domino across here, I can't do those two, and if I put a domino here, I can't get those two. So this doesn't work. So I might go away and I might try another arrangement, and another arrangement, and um, actually I could try lots and lots of arrangements, and they probably wouldn't quite work. Well, they, I know for a fact they couldn't work. But it, it doesn't matter how many arrangements I try, I haven't proved that it's impossible. If we're going to prove it's impossible, we need an argument. We need a kind of mathematical proof. We need a kind of logical proof. We need a, a reasoned argument to explain why this is impossible. Um, and the argument in this case is, is, is quite beautiful and simple and neat. And the argument is that the two dominoes I've removed are both white. They're both diagonal. So I've got 62 squares, but I've got 32 black and 30 white. I've got two extra black squares because I've removed two white squares, OK? So when you place a domino down, it covers neighboring squares. It covers a black and a white. So when I put down 30 of my dominoes, I cover all the white squares, and I'll be left with two black squares remaining because I've got two extra black squares. And my last domino can't cover the two black squares, because the two black squares are never next to each other, OK? So that's an example of something where um, you could try experiments, you could try trial and error, you could try the, and solve the problem for a long time, but having this reasoned, logical proof cuts to the heart of the problem. And that's what people were looking for in Fermat's last theorem. They were looking for a proof. Um, it's one of my favourite quotes from G.H. Hardy, uh, the great mathematician, great kind of early 20th century mathematician, he kind of spearheaded the, the, re, the revitalization of, of English mathematics. Uh, he once said uh, in his Mathematician's Apology, if you've not read it, it's a lovely little book uh, about, about the beauty of mathematics and what mathematics meant to Hardy. Uh, but he once said that Archimedes will be remembered when Aeschylus is forgotten, because languages die and mathematical ideas do not. Immortality may be a silly word, but probably a mathematician has the best chance of whatever it may mean, OK? So these, these proofs, once they're proven, last forever. They're perfect. Um, so what the Greeks wrote about astronomy, we think is a bit of a joke today. What the, what, what the, what the Greeks taught us about medicine, completely wrong. But what they taught us about mathematics, we still teach in universities today. So that kind of just shows us the, the, the everlasting nature of mathematics. So people are desperate to try and get a proof. Uh, I'm going to wrap up fairly soon. Um, these are a couple of people who tried to find a proof. This is a uh, uh, Sophie Germain, French mathematician uh, in the 1800s in Paris. Um, she didn't get a proof, but she began to build some of the arguments as to why some of the, 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 the forms of the equation where maybe n was prime, why it was going to be hard to find numbers that fitted those uh, equations. And she, so she, she did some of the early important work, uh, some of the springboard that other mathematicians would then build on. Um, in Sophie's case, she was obviously very unusual because she was a woman in the 18th century doing mathematics, in the 19th century, sorry, which was very unusual. In fact, she wasn't allowed to attend the university in Paris. Um, but what she decided to do was she, she noticed that one of the students on the course, a male student, of course, had dropped out, a Monsieur Leblanc. And so she pretended to be Monsieur Leblanc and would take home his problem sheets and fill in all the answers and hand them in and then collect the answers all pretending to be Monsieur Leblanc all along. Um, the only problem was Monsieur Leblanc wasn't a very good student, and yet her answers were immaculate. So pretty soon they, they cottoned on to what was happening. Um, 
people like Paul Wolfscale. Paul Wolfscale, um, not a mathematician, an industrialist, very wealthy German industrialist. He, um, he had an interest in mathematics, but, but I say that wasn't his, his, his business. His business was, was industry and, and so on. And at one point in his life, he became very sad because the woman he wanted to marry had rejected him. And having lost his true love, he kind of thought, well, life's not worth living. And he decided to take his own life. And he said, right, tomorrow at midnight, I'll take my own life. And that will give me time to write to my friends and colleagues and set my business affairs and so on. And the next morning, he got up and he started uh, going about his business. And uh, he managed to write his, his letters and farewell letters and so on pretty early on. So he had the evening free before his midnight deadline of taking his own life. So he thought, well, I've got a few hours left to live. What shall I do? Uh, so he thought, I know, I'll go to the library and I'll read some books about maths, because, of course, that's, that's what you would do. Um, and, um, and he found a, uh, he found a manuscript by a German mathematician called Ernst Kummer, where Kummer had said, this is why it's really hard to prove Fermat's last theorem, a building on the work of Sophie Germain, in fact. And, uh, and Wolfsgeist thought, well, this is intriguing. And he looked at it and tried to see if he could prove Kummer was wrong, see if he could find a shortcut to a solution. And he worked on the problem, and he worked on the problem, and uh, he became really captivated by this, this little problem. And before he knew it, the night had passed, the sun had risen, and he'd found a new reason to live. He found a, a new love of his life. And uh, he was so grateful to, to Fermat's last theorem for rescuing him from his uh, attempted, attempt to take his own life, that when he did eventually die in his will, he offered a prize of 10,000 marks for whoever could prove Fermat's last theorem. Something, you know, something like a million dollars in, in today's money for whoever could prove Fermat's last theorem. And, um, and people went away and tried. At, at that point, it's worth stressing that up until this point, Fermat's last theorem was the kind of thing that, that only mathematicians were interested in. But now there was a million dollar prize. It became a, a real phenomenon around the world. And there were soldiers in the trenches you know, writing down proofs and submitting them to Göttingen, where the judging panel was. And, and everybody was trying to find this proof. And nobody found it um, until this guy comes along. Um, and this is Andrew Wiles. This is kind of the hero of the story. I'm going to wrap up here because we'll have time to, to talk about some other things a bit later. But um, I'm showing you a picture of him when he was 10 years old because um, that's the age at which he came across Fermat's last theorem. He was coming home from school one day and he went into his local library in Milton Road in Cambridge and uh, he found a book by E.T. Bell called The Last Problem which was all about Fermat's last theorem. And he picked up this book. And, and the nice thing about Fermat's last theorem is, is a bright 10-year-old can understand the problem. Yeah, it's, it's tough to solve, but it's, it's easy to understand. And the little lad said, you know, I'm going to solve this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to solve it. Couldn't do it. Went to school, talked to his teachers about it. Uh, went on and did his A-levels, kept thinking about this problem. Went on to university, kept thinking about this problem. And and he worked on it for 10, 20, 30 years, um, focused on this problem. And, and so it's a story, you know, it's a story about mathematics, and it's a story about Pierre de Fermat, and it's a story about a great problem, but it's also a story about human obsession and childhood ambition. And um, I'm going to stop here, but if you, know, if, if you get a chance, I'd, I'd really encourage you to watch the documentary. It's still on the BBC iPlayer. You can still Google it. And, and you'll find all about, uh, about it there. Um, but we'll also talk a bit more about this after the break. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.